Shalom, church. Let's try this again. Shalom, church. I, I have a feeling that this side of the room is a little friendlier than this side of the room because they take longer to quiet down and sit down after a while. So that's good. You guys keep it up. That's awesome. Um, I'm joking, of course. I'm not saying no, somebody's not friendly here. But this is a good opportunity for us to connect and just say hello to one another. Um, I see uh, our, our visitor from, are you still in Florida? Welcome back. When are you coming back permanently? No, don't know yet or you're not coming back? <laughs> Okay, let's, we'll talk about that afterwards, right? But uh, we have some visitors from, uh, who are part of our church family but, uh, but are, are, are coming from uh, across the United States. So it's good to see you guys. Uh, if you are here for the first time, I just want to welcome you. My name is Vasily. I'm one of the pastors here at Good News Church, and we're glad that you're here with us. Um, we're doing something a little different here today. Uh, we're, we have the fill-in-the-blanks uh, uh, insert for you in your bulletin. I would encourage you to uh, uh, write it in, even if you, don't keep it, if you don't keep it. Studies have shown over and over again that when you write things down and you're hearing things, then you're able to retain a lot more. And uh, based on my memory and based on the memory of your, most of you, uh, we, all need, we all need to retain things a little bit better. So a couple of announcements. Oh, by the way, if you need pens, um, um, just raise your hand and I'll ask Lily or, or somebody from the back to go ahead and, and give them to you. Uh, we have a few pens for you in the back as well. A couple of announcements before we uh, dig into the Word of God. We have a home group leader training this Saturday at 9 a.m. So uh, if you are a home group leader, if you are assisting with a home group, or if you'd like to find out how to lead a home group, this is this Saturday at 9 a.m. from 9 to 12. So I would encourage you to come. It's going to be just a small circle of friends. We'll have uh, some coffee and, and pastries, and uh, uh, Pastor Michael Jovnir is going to be leading us through that training, uh, so I would encourage those of you who have an interest to, to come. There is no need to register, just show up on Saturday at 9 a.m. Also, the PCSBA convention, which is the Pacific Coast Slavic Baptist Association, of which we're part of, and uh, where I have a privilege of serving. Uh, it's having a convention at the end of October, and we will be um, uh, taking our church van and going. So if you would like to be part of that, the registration is already live on uh, our website. And uh, you can register. There is no cost to you. The church will sponsor the transportation cost, and uh, we'll find you a place to, to sleep over there in Sacramento. So this will be a good way for you to go and represent the church. And I know some of you may, may have family or friends there, so this would be a good opportunity to catch up with them in the evening after the convention as well. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open them to the book of Acts, chapter 17, as we're going to be continuing our study of the book of Acts. Acts 17. I want to talk to you about the culture we live in. And it's a subject that's uh, near and dear to my heart, but it's also a subject that's very controversial. A lot of people have some very strong and passionate opinions about just how involved and how much the church needs to be in the culture. Whether it needs to be involved at all, or maybe it needs to be completely stepped out, or maybe there is some sort of a, of a balance that, that needs to happen. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. We are called as a church to be the light, of the, uh, the light of the world, the light to the world. In Matthew 5.14, it says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. So the question is this. What happens to us? What do we do? How do we react when we see the culture around us, when we see the good things that are happening in the culture, what do we do as a church? When we see the sinfulness of the town around us, of the state around us, of the country, of the, the fallenness of human society, all this depravity and all of the craziness that happens. We've seen on the video earlier, there's some witchcraft going, all kinds of things happening. Well, how do we as a church react to that? Do we care? Do we hide? Do we run away? Or do we act? 
By the way, what's, what's interesting is uh, I, I wanted to mention as an aside, tomorrow, um, I, I didn't realize until recently, tomorrow is going to be seven years since I, was, since I was ordained as one of the pastors here at Good News Church. And the reason I thought of that is, is because over the past three years I've been heavily involved in the uh, PCSBA ministry, uh, our association, and I got a chance to see a lot more churches than just our church. I got the chance to travel to different churches and seeing how they do things, what they're passionate about, how they're organized, how they're uh, doing with reaching people, and, and, and so forth. Maybe learn some from their mistakes, learn from them on how they do good things in their ministry. And so what I can tell you is when I look at churches, and especially Slavic churches, churches with Slavic background like our church, we, we, we look at those churches, and when we look at history overall, we see a very typical reaction. People see the sinfulness of the world, see the crazy things that are happening, see the depravity of human nature, and we want to separate ourselves from it. It's a defense mechanism. We want to build a wall to where all that crazy stuff doesn't come across. And so we become a closed off society of people who don't want anything to do with the culture around us because there is a bunch of bad things that are happening there. And that's nothing new. When we look at the history of the church, we will actually see that there are a number of sects or a number of people of very religious, fervently religious believers who have taken that approach. And they would go and live in the desert, away from all the sinfulness of the cities. Or they would go and join a monastery. They would build up a walls and they would commit themselves to prayer and study of the scripture. And they would stay away from the sinfulness of human societies. We see that throughout the history. We see some people... Uh, who've done that, they're called ascetics. In an extreme form, extreme form of asceticism is people believed that their bodies are the source of their temptation. And so they, what they would do is they would take a whip, sometimes with the metal parts on it, sometimes it would just be tied in the knots, and they would flog themselves, they would beat themselves up. Because their body was so horrible, so sinful, and therefore it needs to be put down and punished. The extreme form of separating yourself from the world in such a way where you don't want anything to do with it. There is another extreme. And that extreme is... Everything is possible, and there is no big deal. Just go into the world. You don't have to be different. You don't have to act different. You don't have to feel differently. You can just be part of the outside culture to such a degree that people don't even see a difference between you and a follower of Jesus. They look at you and say, that guy is not a believer. He lives the same lifestyle as every other non-believer I know. He does all the things that the non-believers do, and he's saying, I have freedom in Christ, and I can do whatever I want. Another extreme that leads to having seen no difference between a follower of Jesus and how he lives and how the world lives. The lines become so blurred to where people become secret Christians, secret followers of Jesus. You wouldn't be able to tell unless they told you. It wouldn't be possible. So how do we not fall into those two extremes? How are we as a church supposed to function in such a way and live in such a way to where we don't have to go and live in a desert or join a monastery, but at the same time, we're not living so immersed in the world to where the lines between us and the world are blurred? Let's take a look at the example that the Bible teaches us, that gives us. And that example is written in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Let's go ahead and read uh, verses 16 through 34 together. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, 
he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, I don't know why I have a mental block on pronouncing that word, so let's... Let's just say it in Russian, Areopagus. Okay, that's how we're going to do it. And said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and I observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. Because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were the Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. What's happening here? Let's study this passage together. And I, it's, it's a long passage, it's a lengthy passage, but I want to see if we can come up with six principles of Apostle Paul engaging the culture. I want to take a look at six things that Apostle Paul does and see how we can apply it to our lives and our church and our families and see how is it that we are to live so that we don't fall into those two extremes between uh, sitting in a monastery in a convent somewhere or actually being so liberal with how we live our lives that there is no difference between us and a non-believer. So, a little bit of background. What's happening in this passage? So, Apostle Paul was preaching in Thessalonica, and he is preaching in a Jewish synagogue, and what's happening is some Jews are responding, some Jews are having a reaction, they're, they're hearing the gospel, they're responding to the gospel, but mostly it was Greeks who were responding, the Gentiles, and also um, women who were leaders of some kind in that in that area. And we see that from Acts uh, 17 5. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked man of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out, out to the crowd. We see the Jews who were in the minority, of whom a few have responded, they are reacting very negatively to what Paul and, and his companions are teaching and preaching. And so they go and they attack the house of Jason. They take him to the authorities. The authorities do a modern day equivalent of a bail. They take monetary deposit from him and let him go. And so what happens is Apostle Paul is, is snuck out into a different city. He is sent to Berea. 
And so they get to Beria, and the same thing happens is they go to the Jewish synagogue, and they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some Jews respond, some Greeks respond, some uh, leading women uh, in that city respond. But the Jews from Thessalonica, they actually hear that Paul is now preaching in Beria, and they come over there, and they do the same thing. They raise up a riot of people, there is a mob, and they, they try to get them in trouble. And so Paul now is sent away even further. He is sent away by ship overseas, and he goes to Athens. That's where he arrives. And he goes by, um, uh, he goes by with, a, with some people, and uh, what happens is Silas and Timothy stays back. And so Paul arrives to Athens, and he sends his companions back to tell Silas and Timothy to go ahead and, uh, and, and come join him. So that's the setting, that's the background of, of what's happening here. Paul is waiting in the city of Athens, and while he's waiting, he's getting to know the city. He's got some time. He's walking around on the streets. He's seeing the market. He's seeing where the synagogue is. He's seeing how the city functions. And at that time, the city of Athens was, most historians think, between 10 and 25,000 people. And it's a big city. It's a city uh, in Greece that is no longer a huge empire. It doesn't have as much of an influence as it did just 500 years before, but still it is a center of education. There's universities there. All the great poets are there. There's beautiful works of art and culture and, and sculptures. Just, just absolutely incredible. And so the first thing we see that Paul does in engaging the culture around him is he gets to know the culture. You cannot engage the culture if you don't know the culture. If you don't understand how they think, if you don't understand what's important to them, if you don't understand what their problem is, you cannot engage it if you don't understand it, if you don't understand what's happening or what, what they're thinking. Paul got to know the culture. He walked the city. He studied it. He was aware of his surroundings. He knew where the marketplace was, where the synagogue was. He knew the city. He knew that culture. Friends, we are to know the culture as well of the city and the state that we live in. We got to understand what makes people tick. We got to understand why is it such a big deal uh, that that bunch of people get together in Super Bowl. What's that all about? How, wh wh what's going on there? See, Paul knew the culture to such degree where he was quoting their poets to them. He was very well educated, and he was quoting those poets to the Athenians. Here's another interesting fact. You won't see any references to the Old Testament scripture in any of these Paul's sermons. You see, when he went to the Jews and the Jewish cities and the Jewish culture, he went back to the Old Testament and he has gone through all of the Mosaic promises that God has given to his people. And then he said, here is how all of these promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But these people are not Jewish. They don't know the Old Testament law. They don't know the Mosaic law. They don't know what the covenants are that God has given to his people. And so Paul does not actually quote any Old Testament scripture. He quotes their poets. He quotes their philosophers. But what he is communicating is very much biblical. So the first thing, the first principle we are to know in engaging our culture is to know it, to understand it. The second thing we must do in order to engage our culture is to grieve over sin. Grieve. The word grieve means to be heartbroken, to express sorrow, to express our brokenness over, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Look at the sin that's happening in this culture. Apostle Paul, when he was walking the streets of Athens, by some count, the historians believe that there were up to 30,000 idols of some sort, statues towards gods of different kinds that were built in the city. 30,000 with a population of anywhere between 10 and 25,000. 
There were more idols than there were people in that city. And Paul, as he spends time in that city, as he is learning the culture, he is brokenhearted about it. He's seeing the sinfulness of the people. He's seeing the brokenness. He's seeing the idolatry of those people. Friends, how do we react to the adultery, idolatry of our town, of our state, of our country? Of our neighbor. Most of the time we are indifferent until something major blows up. Most of the time we're saying that's not my problem. That's the problem of that individual, of that, of that city, of that state, of that country, whatever it is. Paul was broken hearted. He grieved over the sin of the, the idolatry of those people. And he could only do that when he understood their culture, when he saw what was happening. So he, he knew it, he understood it, and he grieved over it. His heart grieved. His eyes were open to those people. Paul just couldn't take it. He didn't say, you know what? This city is so messed up. This city is so full of sin. This city is full of idols. I got to get out of here. I got to move somewhere, I don't know, to Texas or somewhere in Africa. I don't know, whatever. I got to get away from here. This place is horrible. Look at all those idols. No, but what, what's happening is his grief is, is pushing him to action. It's, pull, it's, it's making him act. He didn't run away. He didn't leave the city. He saw the brokenness and his heart moved him to action. So again, the first thing, we've got to know the culture. The second thing, we've got to grieve over sin. And that only happens when we're filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And our eyes are open to the things that are going on around us. The third thing, and this one is a difficult one. We are to affirm what is good. Affirm what is good. To confirm, to state, to support what is good. Good. When Paul reasoned with the people of Athens, know that he did not expect them to come to Christ the way he did. He didn't expect them to become devout Jews, observing every single holiday, observing every single Jewish custom, observing, uh, learning all of the Torah, going through all the things that the Jewish boys have to go through. No. He is starting with them from a place that they knew. And so he's looking at that culture and he's seeing the good things that their society is having. The good things that this full city full of idols is having. And he's starting to build a common ground. He's building a bridge to these people. Friends, so many times you and I, we look at an unbeliever and at least subconsciously we may be thinking, you know what, you got to be like me when you become a believer. Someday when you are mature, you're going to look like me. Because I'm a mature Christian. And so you got to look like me if you're going to be a mature Christian. you got to think the way I think. you got to relate to things the way I relate to. you got to like the same music that I like. you got to have the same manner of speech. That you got to do all those things because I'm the mature Christian. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He didn't start telling them about why the people of Israel were chosen people like he would to the Jewish culture. He didn't start telling them to repent of their idolatry immediately, even though there were more idols in that city than there were living people. He didn't tell them to start behaving differently right away. He didn't say, do this and then you'll become a follower of Jesus. No, he is looking at the good things in their culture. He's looking at the positive things at their culture. And he's affirming that. He's building on that. He starts with their worldview and what they already knew. And then he builds a foundation on that. He says, listen, I go through the city and I see a statue to the, uh, to the unknown God. Well, what's the big deal about that? Think about it. These people were so religious that they had 30,000 idols by some count in their city. But maybe they forgot number 30,001. And they don't want to offend anybody. 
They don't want to offend any idols. And so let's build a statue, let's build an idol to the God that we haven't mentioned yet. We think he's out there. We, we, you know, we, don't, we, we just want to do our thing. We want, to, we want to be religious about it. And so instead of saying, you're crazy, you're worshiping all these dead things, Apostle Paul is saying, oh, you're, you're religious, that's good. You're doing a good thing. I perceive walking through the city that you are religious people. And he builds on that. He affirms what is good. They are understanding that there is something greater than themselves. Paul got to know the culture. He was heartbroken about what he saw. And then he says this, I understand where you're coming from. I get it. You're religious people. And that is good. You're seeking something greater than yourself. He commends them for doing that, for acknowledging that. Friends, when we are having a, a spiritual conversation with somebody, when we are sharing the gospel with somebody, the first thing we got to do is, yes, we got to understand them and know them. The second is, yes, we got, we got to be heartbroken about the sin that's happening in that person's life or in this life of that society. But then we got to look for something that's called the common ground. How are we to build a bridge to be able to speak into their life? That's what we are to do with the culture around us. We are to look around into the culture around us, and some of the things that are happening in Tacoma are pretty crazy. If you haven't seen them yet, you got to look, but they're there. And if we're filled by the Holy Spirit, we'll be heartbroken about it. We won't be able to say, you know what, I'm just going to run away from this place. This is a horrible town. I don't want anything to do with this. We'll be convicted to do something about it, just like Apostle Paul was. And so Paul goes to where the people are. He goes to the synagogue where the Jews are and preaches the gospel. And he actually goes to the marketplace, the marketplace where the Gentiles are, where the unbelievers are. And by the way, the marketplace is a place where they're selling all that meat that was sacrificed to idols. So definitely not a clean place for the Jew to be at. And he goes there and he preaches the gospel. Friends, we as a church are to do the same thing. We're to look at the culture and we're to go after the people in that culture. It could be a marketplace. It could be a festival. It could be a Super Bowl watching party. It could be an alternative to Halloween that we do every year as a, as a kid's Bible program for, the, for that day. It could be a 4th of July celebration that we tag along with. Whatever it is that's happening in the culture and we take it and we redeem it for Christ. We redeem it in His name. We use it to say, you know what, it's good that you want to get together. It's good that you want to celebrate your identity. It's good that you want to do things together as a community. We affirm the positive side of it. And here's the fourth principle that Apostle Paul uses here. He rebukes the bad. This is another one where we have a problem so many times. We say, oh, I'm getting to know the culture. I'm going to go and hang out with these people. I'm going to go to this event. But you never tell them that what they're doing is sinful. You go and do all those things with them. You go and be present there. And you're, you never convict them. You never find the strength, the courage to say that is a sin. That is not what God is telling us in the scripture. Apostle Paul, after he found the common ground, after he found the good religious desire in these people, he tells them in verses 24 through 29 that all of these idols, all of these man-made idols are useless. He's saying it's good that you have this desire, it's good that you're a religious people, but guess what? The God who deserves to be worshipped, the God who is the creator of this universe, He is not the kind of God who can sit into this man-made kind of, kind of container. He is not the kind of God that can be portrayed on an image. He, he doesn't note, quote, the Old Testament prohibition about making the images either. He is saying, He's appealing to their logic, He's appealing to their philosophy, and He's saying, listen, do you really want to worship this kind of God that you could create? Our God is so much greater than that. The true God cannot be contained. 
He's not limited. Paul is proclaiming the self-sufficiency and the existence of the one true God without quoting a single Old Testament scripture because he's talking to a bunch of Greek idol-worshipping people. Amazing. That's the God, the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, personal, and intimate God that we are to worship. Friends, the same true to us today. The same is true to you and I, to us today. We have idols in our lives that we have self-created, that we have taken and created in our lives. Just like the Athenians have created 30,000 idols for their own population, we here, with however many people we got here, we got at least one idol for each person sitting here today. For some of us, it's fame. For others, it's money. For others, it's drugs and alcohol. For others, it's sexual stuff. For others, it's possessions. Whatever it is. Friends, the only thing that will satisfy our desire to seek God is God Himself. Not anything that you and I can create. Not anything that the Athenians have created in their city only the one true and living God who created the universe, who sustains it every day, who sustains you and I. And we must call sin for what it is. We must call out the sin in the lives of people. We must call the sin out in the name of our, in, in, within our culture. But if that's all we do, that's not going to be effective. Ver, the fifth principle that we can see the Apostle Paul is practicing here, is he's proclaiming the truth. He's proclaiming the gospel. He's proclaiming who Jesus Christ is. And in verse 30 and 31, we see this. The times of ignorance God overlooked. God let you slide up until this point. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. He is telling these people who are religious in their nature but are worshiping the wrong gods. He is saying it is time to repent. And if God lets you slide up until this point, now it's different. Well, what's different? What changed? And he points all of this to Jesus Christ. He says, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the word in righteousness. God will judge the world and he will do it through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, you will be found guilty. And if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you will be declared righteous because of him covering your sins up on the cross. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Who is this talking about? Who is this talking about? Jesus. God appointed a man through whom he will judge the world in righteousness. And of this, he has given assurance. Listen, he has given you proof. He can prove it that he is going to do this. And how did he prove this? He has given us assurance by raising up Jesus Christ on the third day. From the dead. Incredible. Incredible. This has got to be the most gospel-centered sermon without quoting any scripture. The resurrection of Jesus, friends, listen to this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ brings a whole different level of accountability for you and I. The resurrection of Jesus Christ creates a whole new level of the accountability that God gives to all of His people. You see, the true satisfaction in God, the true satisfaction in this religious desire that we often express, that the Athenians have expressed by building all those idols, it comes with repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. The same one who will rule the world. The same one who will judge the world. The same one who was resurrected on the third day. Paul is preaching the truth. He is preaching the gospel. He is preaching Jesus. He's saying Jesus died for your sin and for my sin. 
And on the third day, he was resurrected. And now that the world knows it, now that you know this, and now that the Athenians have heard it, you and I are accountable to the most important question that we can answer in our lives. And that question is, what are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do about Jesus? Are we going to say that didn't happen? Are we going to say he was just a good rabbi, a good teacher, but he's not really a son of God? What are we going to do with Jesus? A whole totally new level of accountability. So often what happens is we make friends in the world, out there in the culture around us. We get to know their culture, and we say, this is good. We affirm them. And then maybe occasionally we say, you know what? This is not right. I don't support that. But then we stop there, and we don't point them to Jesus Christ. Then we stop there and we don't tell them that, you know what, all of this is not just good morals. All of this is not just because I'm a good person. All of this is not because I'm smarter than you are or I know better or I've read a bunch of books. None of that matters. All of this is because of Jesus Christ who was resurrected on the third day. And through him, God will judge you and I for righteousness. Friends, if we try to be good people on our own, it's all useless. It's just a bunch of moralizing. It's a bunch of advice that doesn't matter. Repentance is what we as old people are commanded to do. The judgment day is coming. And the proof of that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So again, know the culture. Grieve over sin. Affirm the good. Rebuke the bad. And proclaim the truth. Proclaim the truth. Sixth principle. <clears throat> Sixth principle that we can see here. You've got to entrust God with the results. We are to trust God that He is going to do the work. So many times we do things, we preach, we do great things in His name. We do things as a church. We do things with our neighbors on an individual level. And we're wondering, well, God, did you work in that life? Did you not work in that life? What, what, what happened there? Here's the interesting thing. Here's what happened to Apostle Paul. He had three different reactions there. The first reaction was that some people laughed. And they said... You're crazy. For resurrection of the dead, that doesn't happen. That body is decomposing. That's not going to happen. Jesus resurrected on the third day. That's impossible. Scientifically proven. And we hear that in our culture today. We got so much technology. We got so much science. We can see further in the universe than we've ever been able to see before. And people laugh when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's the response you get when you share the gospel, just entrust God with the results. Entrust God. It is up to Him to change the heart of a person, not mine, not yours. You see, me as a pastor, me as a preacher, I'm not responsible for changing your heart. See, what I am responsible for here right now is to communicate the gospel as clearly and as effectively as I can and as true as it is, as close as it is to what the people have heard through the Holy Spirit-inspired writings of Apostle Paul and, and their other authors of the books of the Bible. God works in your heart based on how obedient you are, based on how open you are to hearing His voice in your life, and all those other things. Maybe there is a sin in your life that's blocking the Holy Spirit to work fully in your life the way He needs to work. I don't know. You do. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says this, Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Only God gives the growth. The results are not up to us. Our, the, we are responsible to be faithful to God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's the first reaction that Paul has heard. People laughed. People mocked. They said this is impossible. The second type of reaction that the people had to Apostle Paul preaching is they're saying, you know what? That's kind of interesting. I'm not ready to make a decision. I'm not saying this is true. But I want to learn more. Let's talk about this. 
And friends, if you have experienced somebody in your life who reacts that way, don't turn on the preacher mode and give them a 45-minute sermon at that point. Just answer their question the best way you can. If they want to have answers to their questions, if you know the answer, give them an answer. If you don't, go figure out an answer. Talk to some pastors, read a good book, come back to them and give them the answer. But always start and end with the Word of God. You see, only the Word of God has the, the ability and the power to change. Not any good advice, not anything that I do, not anything that you do. Only the Word of God. And if you do that, God will lead your conversation. He will guide your conversation. And the Holy Spirit is going to do His thing. The third type of response that we see here is that people accepted the gospel. And their life was changed. Their life was transformed. And so if you experience that in your life, if you, if you work with people and within, you, within the culture of your town and, and you see that people are responding to the gospel, then you got to point them to a local Bible-based church. you got to spend some time one-on-one -on, -one on them. you got to invite them to the home group. Invite them to church. Disciple them. Discipleship is not a responsibility of just the pastor of the church. It is the responsibility of every disciple of Jesus Christ. Yours, mine, all of us. Friends, as I said earlier, the question of engaging the culture always leads to the question of what are we going to do with who Christ is. And so remember, God uses ordinary people, regular people, like you and I, to make his children into disciples of Jesus Christ. The same disciples who then changed the world for Christ in his name. And so my desire is that we would be the kind of church that follows the example of Apostle Paul. We would be the kind of church that doesn't run away into the desert and build monastery walls to protect ourselves from the culture. That we would be the light in the world, the kind of light that cannot be hidden, that sits on the hill and illuminates the darkness. It chases it away. That we would actually know the culture. We would grieve over the sin that we see around us. And that we would affirm the good, yes, but we would also would confront the bad. We would rebuke the bad. And we wouldn't stop there, but we would point those people to Jesus Christ. And that we would entrust to God the results. It's not up to us to change hearts. Apostle Paul was much more skillful at preaching and teaching than any of us probably are. But that's the kind of response you got. So if you see that, if you experience that, you're in good company. May God give us the power, the ability, and the inspiration to be that kind of church. Amen? Amen. Let us uh, stand and pray.